Is it just a conspiracy theory that this is all linked to communism and Marxism, right? I've been accused of that, yeah. And then especially for me, because I came out of communism and Marxism, they're like, well, George, it's just your lens. You just, you're interpreting everything you see in America because that's your family's lens. When did you sort of have your red pill moment? Maybe something is desperately wrong in America as well. It was in my AP English class. We were made to, to read a, a, a book that was very pornographic in nature. I took the book to my dad and I said, hey, dad, look what they're making us read. Like, I, I don't want to read this book. He was in shock. He's like, what in the world is this? Like, you know, we grew up under communism and even though communists were atheists, uh, they never made you read this kind of filth, you know? Is there hope for our public school system or is this a get out now message? For the last 50 years, here's all of the tactics that have been tried and they've all failed. Not just like barely, but miserably. We send missionaries to cannibals. We don't feed them our children. Welcome to Loopcast. My guest today is George Rosca, and for all of you Catholic parents out there, you'll enjoy this. He is the eighth of 12 children uh, born in Romania under the communist regime of Nicolae Ceausescu. I think I said that correctly. His family immigrated to the States legally in 1991, and he grew up in Southern California. He lives in Orange County with his wife and four children. And we'll get into what it's like living under the People's Republic of California soon. Uh, he's a founding board member of Protect Our Kids, which is a national coalition of parents, community leaders, attorneys, physicians, pastors, teachers, and concerned citizens. And they're all united in the belief that today's public schools threaten our children's welfare. And we will get deeply into that throughout this interview you can find him and all of their good work at protectourkidsnow.org. I will drop that in the show notes. Please be sure to check it out at the end of this conversation. George, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Erica, for having me. It's glad, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, I'd love to dig into your personal story because you sort of are the American dream in some ways. And it's also, I think, contributed probably to your avocation of helping parents see what's going on in our school system and getting their kids out. So if you could talk to us a little bit about um, your childhood in Romania. Um, I know you were born there. I'm not sure how old you were when you left. Um, but your parents' experience of raising kids under a communist regime. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about your family history. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And it wasn't that long ago because I'm not that old either. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course not. I didn't mean to imply it. Uh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that for, for your audience because a lot of times when people introduce me, they expect somebody old to come up, you know? Mm -hmm. And when they see such a young face, um, it, it's hard to make that connection. Like, what, wait up, communist was, communism has been around that recently. Um, so yeah, so I'm the eighth of 12 children um, in Romania. Romania after World War II, uh, shortly after that in 1947, basically succumbed to the pressures of uh, Russia and we basically became a, a proxy within the, uh, behind the Iron Curtain to all the, the Russian powers. Um, sometime in the, the 50s and 60s, um, and Nicolae Ceausescu rose to power uh, after the first uh, leader, Gheorghe Gheorghe Udej. And from there, he really started to implement, um, you know, crazy, crazy policies w within Romania. My grandfather, you know, and, well, my grandparents on both sides, they basically lost all of their personal property. Um, you know, my dad was born in 1951. My mom was born in 1952. Uh, so they were already born as basically slaves to the state uh, because the state owned everything, including your children. Um, my oldest sister was born in uh, 1973, and then I was born in 1985. Uh, communism didn't uh, um, you know, end until December 1989. So... Uh, throughout that that whole time period, you know, my my parents grew up in the government run school system. There was no such thing as public uh, private schools, charter schools, 
homeschooling. Homeschooling. Yeah. <laughs> no. no such thing. You were forced mm -hmm. to send your children to um, the government run schools, um, which basically had a, um, just like Hitler had the Hitler Youth Program, uh, Ceausescu had a similar thing. It was called the Pioneers. Um, and you'll see how the use of language um, is, is always something that communists are, are so good at doing. Uh, they know how to use positive language, but everything about it is pure evil. Um, so, um, yeah, my, my dad, my parents grew up basically in those, um, you know, youth programs. Uh, in fact, when my parents were going to school, they were going to school six days a week. And, and that was because, um, Ceausescu really wanted to keep kids away from their parents. That's a huge goal of, of communism. Um, and then especially for the Christian kids, he wanted to keep them away from their families on Sundays as well. So every now and then there used to be field trips and field trips were always, uh, organized on Sundays. Um, so that way parents wouldn't take their children to church, uh, with them. So, so things it's like that. It's sounding eerily familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so how your parents decide after the revolution then, because the revolution's in 1989 to end communism. Um, we see that all over the, behind the, where the Iron Curtain had fallen. Then they choose to come to America uh, after that happened. So what, what was it that inspired them to pick up 12 kids and move across an ocean? Yeah, so... Back in uh, my dad's teenage years, he was he was rebellious, um, and he didn't want to um, you know remain in the faith, so to speak. Uh, so what, he went off throughout high school and kind of did his own thing. Well, uh, he had a very interesting encounter with the Lord at, um, when he was eighteen years old, and um, he decided that you know what God is real, uh, heaven is real. Uh, he needs to you know, get his act together. Um, and so he was actually very involved in the communist youth party. Wow. And, uh, one of the things that, uh, the, the communist party was very keen on was, um, kind of, uh, hand picking future leaders and especially, um, in, in all areas of society, not just political leadership, uh, but also leaders in the arts and music and science and, uh, school and everywhere. So my dad was a singer and he was kind of being groomed to become a future, you know, artist, uh, in the country. And, um, when he gave his life to the Lord, he knew that he couldn't sing anymore the songs that the communists wanted him to sing. So, um, he, he became, uh, placed on a watch list. Uh, he started getting involved in the local church and in 1975, he was actually fined uh, by a police officer for the first time because he was singing uh, church songs on his front porch. So for the next seven years, um, he was on a watch list. Um, he would get randomly picked off the street and uh, by the secret police, take it into you know dark interrogation rooms. You know, tell us where you're going to church. Tell us who the new converts are. Tell us. Uh, what was preached by the pastor, um, because they wanted to make sure that nobody's preaching anti-communist propaganda. So finally in 1982, uh, this was in June on my mom's 30th birthday, he doesn't come home. And my, my parents, uh, just had their seventh child at that time, uh, which was my, my older brother, uh, my mom, you know, worried, where is he? Well, he was taken to prison and, uh, they kept him in prison for, uh, a month. They kept him on house arrest for six months, uh, where he was only allowed to go to, uh, work and back, uh, because, um, they obviously wanted him to go to work. He was a very skilled worker. Um, and they wanted to use, um, and in fact, they ended up using, during those six months, um, 80% of his wages 
to pay his prison expenses, all the food and, and, and everything that he got there. So, you know, after all of those experiences, um, my dad was trying to find a way to get out of the country. And in 1988, so b- before communism fell down, he applied, um, as a, um, a political refugee through the program that, uh, Ronald Reagan had going on at that time. Um, and so as soon as he applied for that, um, at the, uh, U S consulate, U S embassy in, in Bucharest, um, the, um, the communist government in Romania, you know, once they found that out, um, they kicked them out of the job. They kicked all of us out of our house. Um, so we, we had to actually pay the government rent to go back into our own house to live. Uh, they kicked all of us kids out of school. Um, they took away any kind of allowances that my dad was given through his workplace for, for, uh, for the kids and for school. Uh, so my older siblings who were anywhere between, you know, second, third grade and high school at that time, um, if they weren't allowed to go to school. Uh, so. Wow. They really target the whole family. Then. They do. Oh they my do. Gosh. So finally, um, we got all of our paperwork approved. Um, again, I think it was in 1989 when the paperwork was approved. Then the whole revolution happened. Um, in 1990, um, the, the paperwork was finalized, but we weren't able to come until September of 91. So it was just before my seventh birthday. Wow. What a big change for a little guy, a six, seven year old. Huge. To pick up like that. Yeah, huge. So how much of, how much of all this were you aware of? I mean, you were pretty young. Then growing up, were you, were you kind of cognizant of what your father had suffered for his faith really, and suffered for the Lord back in Romania? Was it part of your family conversation? It, it was. It was. I mean, I was well aware of it uh, before we moved to America. Um, and, and you know, some of that probably just stems from the fact that, you know, you, you, you've experienced that persecution uh, constantly, you know, going to church, being, you know, uh, taunted by your neighbors, you know, my, my, especially my older siblings who, uh, who were already much more aware and much more mature than I was to understand all of that. Um, you know, dealing with the bread lines, you know, dealing with shortages of food, um, growing up in a town where, you know, you only had electricity, you know, maybe whenever the communists decide to turn it on, um, you know, no running water, no sewer, uh, no car. Um, we we're, you know, out on a farm in a little town. And, um, we just made do with, with what we had. Um, but I, I was well aware of it. And then I think what helped to retain a lot of those memories as well as once we moved to America, um, you know, we, we moved in, uh, into Fullerton in Orange County in California. Um, and most Romanian immigrants would stick together, um, and growing up in a Romanian church, most of the people who made it from Romania to America at that time, uh, were for, you know, very similar reasons that our family left as well. So you grow up in this immigrant bubble, um, where everybody experienced to one degree or another, what you experienced. And so you are able to, you know, keep that, um, maybe oral tradition and pass things down to the next generation. That's wonderful. So it wasn't quite a bubble, though, because I believe you went to public school. You you were an American public school student. Correct. So I want to turn a little bit. It's an amazing story, and it it is so shocking to hear. I mean, you think of these conditions, and you're like, oh, yeah, World War II. Yeah, sure, like, you know, 90 years ago, and that's all over. But it's very real and very present. And, um, yeah, I know that, you know, Eastern Europe is still suffering many of the aftershocks um, and the effects of all those years under communism. Um, but I do want to turn a little bit to taking your story and to the work that you're doing now. 
Um, you were a product of the public school system. I went to public school uh, for many years as well. And now it's sort of your your mission to warn parents and help them get their kids out of the school system. Um, so for what was the change for you? Um, where, when did you sort of have your red pill moment, as it were, that maybe this isn't, maybe something is desperately wrong in America as well? Well, th- there was a couple factors that kind of converged to uh, my, my way of thinking about this. Um, so yeah, when I came here in September 91, straight into first grade, my parents couldn't afford to homeschool all of us, private school all of us. <laughs> uh, and and they they didn't understand the public school system here either. Um, so they were you know just figuring out what America is like, how things work. Um, so we were basically off on our own, and um, you know grounded in in God's word. My mom was a stay at home mom. She would talk with all of us you know, every day she wanted to know, you know, what school was like, what they were teaching us. Um, and so my mom did a really good job of staying connected with us. Um, in my senior year in high school, I experienced probably just one major thing, uh, that, you know, I, I kind of forgot later on. And then I'll, I'll mention you know, I'll, I'll connect the dots of when I re re remembered that experience, but, um, it was in my AP English class where we were made to, to read a, a, a book that was very pornographic in nature. It even had bestiality scenes in it. And, and this was like before you finished chapter one. So I, I took the book to my dad and I said, Hey dad, look what they're making us read. Like, I, I don't want to read this book. And he was in shock. He's like, what in the world is this? Like, you know, we grew up under communism and even though communists were atheists, uh, they never made you read this kind of filth, you know? Um, and so I, he's like, okay, go back to your teacher, tell her that you're not going to do this assignment. So I did that. The teacher was like, well, nobody's ever complained about this book. You're the first one to ever say that. And, and I'm like, well, I don't care. I, I'm just not going to read it. Uh, give me it. It's yeah, still it, wrong, <laughs> even if I'm the only one. <laughs> and so she's like, well, um, there's nothing I could do about it. You have to go talk to the principal. So I went, I talked to the principal. Um, I was also very involved in the Bible, uh, Bible club on campus. I had three other buddies who were in my same class and we started talking about, you know, what this book was all about. They talked to their parents. And so the, the four of us with our fathers went into the principal's office and the principal got a rude awakening from us. Um, and so even though the, they finally gave us an alternative assignment, it felt more like a punishment because we were given two alternates to read. One was war and peace. <laughs> <laughs> and and oh the goodness. other one was paradise lost um which, which is like <laughs> you know 1400s oh, language man. english right or something like that so that's a lot of work to me yeah that was my first experience with what's happening in the public schools and so graduated went on to get my my bachelor's my master's started working started having kids and it wasn't until 2018 in april um my wife was following a a a mom on a facebook who had her own show um her name is heidi saint john she's up in the pacific northwest area and she had shared an article that was called out the national sex ed sit out day and my wife's from Romania as well. She grew up there and, and I met her as an adult and we got married and brought her over here. So she didn't go through the public school system here. So, oh, interesting. so she sent me that article and she's like, George, what, what is this? Like you went through the system here. Why do Americans need to do exactly, this? <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, what in the world is this? So, um, I read the article and then for the next three weeks, um, after I was putting my kids down to bed. And at that time, 
um, we just had three children. My, my third was born, um, not even a year before that she was like seven or eight months old. And that was my, my first and only daughter. I have three boys and a girl. Oh, and, and I say that because that's what like really, you know, like made my antennas go up. Um, because now having, having a, a girl, girl, now you have a baby, have a girl. baby girl wow. and I have to think about her and how would she be exposed to all of this filth, uh, in the public school system. And what I found out by reading that article was that in California, there was a, um, a bill that had already passed three years prior in 2015 called the California Healthy Youth Act. We've got one of those here in Connecticut. Yep, the Healthy Youth Act. And so Act. again, Terrible coming stuff. back to language, right? You know, the the pioneers youth program all sounds cool, but it's right. nothing. Healthy youth it sounds, sounds great. Who exactly. could object? It sounds all great, but it's all filthy and evil. So from there, um, I started researching and reading, and then I found out that our uh, our, you know, California already had a bathroom bill that it passed five years prior in 2013, um, that seven years prior, uh, the, the history curriculum, um, was changed to now celebrate LGBTQ, uh, people, um, you know, regardless if they were pedophiles or not, you know, that didn't matter. They were just LGBTQ. So we should laud them, um, and, and so just started researching. And so I'm like, okay, what can I do about this? Like, I never experienced this. And that's when that experience from my senior in high school first came to mind. And I'm like, okay, so if I dealt with that, um, and I'm, I'm the eighth in my family, but I'm the middle one in terms of age. So I still have, uh, you know, my two younger siblings who are nine and 11 years younger than me. So at that time in 2018, um, you know, I, I called up my, my little sister, my little brother. I'm like, Hey, you recently graduated from high school. Tell me what was your experience like? And they started to tell me like, okay, this is what we were dealing with. Um, you know, I graduated from high school in 2003, you know, they did in 2012 and 2014. So they were already starting to get, um, the, um, the notions of like toxic masculinity was like the big thing for them that was being, uh, propagated. Um, you know, the, the, the differences in gender, uh, not full blown gender identity and gender expression. Um, but the whole, you know, gay and lesbian movement, um, a Berger fell obviously happened in, in 2015. So they were already dealing with all of that in, in high school because of all the GSA clubs that were already pretty powerful, um, which back when I was around the GSA clubs were non-existent. So it was like, okay, wow. What, what they went through was night and day different from what I went through. And, and so I'm like, okay, if in 10 short years, that's how drastically things changed. And now it's 2018. It's, it's like crazy what should be going on right now. So then I started digging into my local school district and, um, I actually found out that, um, there was a, a meeting coming up in our County board of education. And I looked up on their website. I looked at what the agenda was and it just so happened to be that the agenda for that month, May, 2018 was the California healthy youth act. And they're li <laughs> like, I know about exactly. that now. And, and it was, sh it's like a short four page law, you know? So it's easy to read it very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, thankfully with, with all of my, my professional background, I understand how, um, governments work, how boards are run, how agendas are published and put together. And so, um, you know, I, I found that information out pretty quickly. Um, but one of the things that shocked me about that agenda item was the, the legal counsel for the board of education had, um, published a four page memo that basically said that, well, with the new California healthy youth act, as opposed to the old sex education, which was biology and anatomy, uh, you can't opt out of it anymore. Parents. 
And right. I'm, that's a big and change. That's a big change. <laughs> but I was reading the law and I was reading his legal memo and I'm like, it doesn't make sense. The law to me still read that you can opt out. So I wrote my three minute speech and I was ready to go and give it there. Um, and sure enough, that's when I, um, went, I gave my first, you know, public comment on these topics and, um, I ended up meeting, uh, and connecting with other like-minded parents who were there, who were starting to figure this stuff out on their own. And, um, we, we started to network together and with some of them, um, I continued to really, uh, fight and, and trying to figure out what we could do. Um, and we couldn't find other organizations that were like talking about this. Um, the, the closest True. thing. Yeah. Right. Cause this is two years before the COVID lockdowns, which I think most of us following education think of the pandemic shutdown of schools as the moment parents woke up to this, but you're, you're two years ahead Correct. of that. So yeah, you're on the cusp of what do we do about yeah. it? So the first thing that, that I did was, um, with two of these parents, we ended up starting a Facebook group. Um, that Facebook group was called informed parents of California. Um, and that exploded, you know, by the end of the year, which was, you know, six months later, um, we had over 30,000 members and, and I'm like, okay, we're onto something here. We have to get this message out. At that time, there was 6.2 million kids in the California public school system. And, and I'm like, how do we reach the parents of 6.2 million kids? That's a it's a lot of people. Of people. <laughs> um, so the other thing that happened to me at that time was I, I'm, I'm also a pastor and I ended up connecting with a pastor's network in California called Church United. And I became pretty close friends with the leader of that network. There was over 700 pastors in that network. And, and I told him, I said, Hey, Pastor Jim, do you know about all of this stuff? Like, what can we do to share this information in all of the churches that are part of the network? And in April of 2019, we actually put together our very first conference. We did like a little pilot and we said, okay, let's, let's choose three churches. Let's go in there. Let's do a conference and let's see what the reaction of parents is like. Well, April and May, 2019, we did those three conferences. We had over 700 parents in person at each of those conferences. Wow. Wow. Yeah. What a turnout. Huge turnout. And they were long conferences. I mean, how many times do you hear parents say that I'm going to go to a three to four hour conference? Right. Nobody has that time. And they were there. They, yeah. You hit they a sat there. there. They were engaged. They were asking questions. We would stay for like two more hours after the conference to, to mingle with parents and to answer questions. And so that's when with my, my friend, Mark Schneider, we said, okay, this, we have to do something about this. There was a need to inform and educate parents on what's going on. And that's when Protect Our Kids was birthed out of those uh, initial conferences. That's amazing. And now you're all over the country and traveling and helping other groups. There's, there's a lot of groups now, I think, that have sprung up with a similar mission. Um, one of the things that struck me was your, and I hate to say that it's marketing because then people think it's, oh, it's shallow and just to get attention, but marketing is really important when you have to reach 6.2 million parents or set, you know, children's parents. Um, and I think one way that POK boiled it down that I thought was really helpful in understanding what's going on in the school system was this uh, triple threat sort of approach of diagnosing the problem. So could you just briefly explain what is the triple threat? And, and then we can go into maybe like what parents, what was, what was it about that schematic that made it possible for so many parents to say, aha, that's what I'm seeing and I need to know more. So what is the triple threat? Yes. And I agree with you, Erica, you know, marketing is very important and it, it's important from the standpoint of you are trying to reach an audience that you have such a tiny amount of time with. How do you communicate effectively? So where they have their own aha moment, like I had my own aha, aha moment. So there are so many things that are wrong within the public school system. 
And we started tallying up all of those. And we're like, there's no way we can just say, hey, parents, come to a conference so you can learn about these 20 things. It's overwhelming. And one thing that we said, okay, how about, what are the top three things that we could clearly say is wrong with the public school system? And that maybe those other 17 things in our top 20 list really fall under. Um, and that's when we came up with this concept of the triple threat. Um, and the triple threat is number one, uh, sex and gender ideology. Um, this has really been the gateway drug for America. Um, you know, in, in the past it was called the sexual revolution. Um, but we call it the sex and gender ideology because it kept, it stems from a worldview that we finally have a name for. And that worldview is critical theory. And so we help parents understand that, okay, if there is a certain way that you can view the world and it's the critical theory lens and that everything in critical theory is an oppressor versus oppressed, now think of sex as being just a word sandwiched in between this worldview. So it's critical sex theory, critical gender theory. Um, the second threat was critical race theory. And then the third threat is critical, uh, it's social emotional learning, which is basically taking the worldview and what is the mechanism by which you infuse it and teach it in the public schools. So social emotional learning is that methodology or that pedagogy uh, that is being used to instill sex and gender ideology and critical race theory everywhere. It could be your science class. It could be your health class. It could be your English class. Math is now, you know, gone woke. Um, and so that's in a nutshell, how we were able to kind of help parents think through on, on digesting this very quickly. Yeah. And I think that um, it was really interesting how you started off explaining this dynamic that they lean that it leans into any of these critical theories of oppressor versus oppressed. That if you boil it all down to there, that it's you know victim. You always believe the victim. That kind of mentality. But what it it call, calls to mind for me is studying communism and Marxism because very much that whole notion of the dialectic that. History is the story of the struggle between the workers, the proletariat, the farmers, and then the oppressors. Well, this is just, you know, in America, that's expressing itself through the sexual revolution, through critical race theory, critical gender theory, and all of these. And um, I think for me, that, that tie between what was happening under communism and now what's happening under this triple threat or has been happening basically since you and I were at the end of our high school careers, um, that's, it's key to understanding the tactics that the left uses in our schools. One of which you mentioned under communism is this deliberate attempt to separate children from their families and from the church. You know, put them in school six days a week. And American parents, like, we play along, right? We, we play soccer on Saturday and Sunday, and we miss church to go to soccer games. You know, we're like voluntarily doing what the communists were making your parents do. Um, and I, I really appreciate the way POK has articulated all of that. Um, I would encourage listeners, if you want to know more about any of these elements of triple threat, um, there are some great sort of PragerU style videos that you all have done um, that, goes, that help, help you to articulate too, so you can talk to your friends and your school boards as well. Um, Erica, I can I talk? Erica, can yeah, I just go for it, please. One more thing, because w one thing that I, I like, I want American parents here to understand, um, is that the, the they seem to think, and a, a lot of times I get the, this question, like, is it just a conspiracy theory that this is all linked to communism and Marxism? Right? I've been accused of that. Yeah, Correct. tell me. <laughs> and and then especially for me, because I came out of communism and Marxism. They're like, well, George, it's just your lens. You just, you're interpreting everything oh. you see in America because that's your family's lens. And, and I, I want to at least create one more linkage here for American parents to understand. 
that what we are dealing with today in America is in fact a Marxist, a neo-Marxist revolution. It, it is an all-out war that's happening. And here's the linkage. Karl Marx and Hegel, when, when they propagated their theories okay, in Europe, what they found is that during their lifetime, they were only successful in the East. They were never successful in the West. They died, their disciples, the next generation of Marxists. This is now the, the teens and the 20s and the 30s of the 1900s. They look back at, you know, their, their gods, you know, Karl Marx, you know, and Hegel, like, wait up, are, are gods wrong? You know, I thought they were authoritative. They should be right all the time. And what they pinpointed, they said, well, in the East, communism and Marxism really was, and, and I'll use the word Marxism because Marxism really is the overarching thing. Communism is just the application of Marxism to economics. So in the East, Marxism spread because you had this class struggle. And so they took advantage of the class struggle and said, bourgeoisie versus proletariat. Well, Marx's disciples, especially Antonio Gramsci, who is an Italian, he wrote in his thick book that he wrote in prison, okay, he said that, th that the only way that we can go into the West and win our Marxist revolution is we can't go with a class war because in the West, you had something very unique. The West had been very influenced by Judeo-Christian worldview. You had a, a different kind of free market uh, that, was, that created a middle class. So there was no proletariat versus bourgeoisie. So then they said, well, how do we revolt against the Western system? Well, they noted that we have to cut it off from its roots, which is the Judeo-Christian worldview. And they said that we have to transform the consciousness of society. And what is the consciousness of society in the West and especially in America? Well, what do we boil ourselves down to? You can, Dennis Prager always says, look at a coin, right? And God, we trust, you know, liberty uh, and e pluribus unum out of many one. And, and so Gramsci specifically said, we have to remove the Judeo-Christian worldview out of that. So then how did they attack America? Well, they looked at America and they saw the, the sex struggle and the race struggle. And they utilized these two things from the 60s and 70s to come in and to infuse their critical theory-based, you know, worldview here. Yeah, it's chill. I mean, it's it's just chilling to hear it laid out like that. And I think the accusations that, you know, you're just, you're saying this because your parents were under communism, you're seeing it through this lens or, um, you, you know, you hear that, well, you're just saying this because you're a Christian. Um, it's failure to tackle the actual historical evidence that's before us. If you take the time to actually read the founding documents of Marxists, um, the books, Gramsci, I mean, You've got to read, I think, of the Frankfurt School, too, over here in New York City. Um, it's really important. And I'll put a few resources in the links of the show notes if anyone wants to dig into that history of Marxism coming to the United States through these um, mechanisms. So I did want to ask this question. I interview a lot of people about education, and there's a lot of different answers. We've painted kind of a bleak picture here of the public school system. From your point of view, from what you've seen in the last six years of this work, is there hope for our public school system or is this a get out now message? I, I would say there's, there's both. Uh, what we are saying with POK is we are loudly trumpeting the get out now message. Um, and it's because it's a tactical retreat. Uh, now, it's a tactical retreat for our children. So when we say get out now, it means get your children out now. They are not capable of handling the teachers and the teachers union influence and the administrators who are bombarding them left and right just about every day with this worldview. Um, but what we are also saying is if you are a parent, get involved, 
in your public school. Join the PTA, the PTSA. Get involved because you can be a force for good to stop a lot of this bleeding. If you're a parent, run for school board. Get involved in your local school board or in other kind of committees uh, that the school board puts out, you know, curriculum review committees and things like that. If you're a teacher, our message is, and especially if you're a Christian teacher, go and teach in public schools because you have so much leverage and autonomy over how you teach subjects and over how your classroom is decorated, what goes on and what does not go on, right? Uh, we also encourage teachers to get out of the teachers union, the NEA, the AFT, the CTA here in California, they are not your friends. Please remove yourself from there and give yourself a once in a lifetime pay raise. You don't have to take that $1,300 here in California that you're paying to union dues, go spend it on your family vacation. Um, <laughs> or your we, groceries. Thank you. Or ben. your groceries. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and we also tell them that they're, you know, usually teachers are like so anxious. Like if I leave my union, I won't have legal representation. I won't have this. There is a great alternative called Christian educators. If you go to Christian educators, uh, I think dot org, uh, or just Google them, their former name was Christian Education in the International or Christian Education Association International, C E A I. Um, but they've now simplified just to Christian educators. Uh, they are a really good organization. I think for like a third of the annual cost, you get like double the benefits that you usually get from your local teachers union. So yeah, so that's our message. Get out now. But at the same time, we adults have to go in and do the hard work. Now, is the public school system, the government run system redeemable? Um, I highly doubt it. And there has been some really good books. Uh, you probably know of one popular one called Get Out Now. Um, and um, there, there's two moms who wrote it. Their names slipped my mind right now. I'll put um, them in the show notes too because I can't remember either. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. Uh, Mary Rice something and something for non. Um, but they did an excellent job of saying, okay, parents, for the last 50 years, here's all of the tactics that have been tried in parents in generations past to redeem the public school system, and they've all failed. Not just like barely, but miserably. So until you know you figure out how to do that and actually be successful, get your children out now. And there is a quote that I like to use from that book because they said this, we send missionaries to cannibals. We don't feed them our children. Oh, I love it. That's, that's priceless. And that to me completely framed the whole argument because now as believers, we also believe in God's sovereign protection over our children. And, and I know that where there are no options, uh, because we speak at, to, you know, parent conferences all the time, 90% of parents, especially California have no option. They're like, George, we are both working to barely make ends meet. Right. We, we can't afford to homeschool because we're not home. We can't afford to private school. We're, we're trying to get our children maybe into a charter school that is, isn't teaching all of this garbage, mm -hmm. but, but it's still bad. So we're right. stuck in our public schools. What do we do? And, you know, I look back at my parents experience in Romania, my older siblings experience in Romania, that was our only option. And all of my dad's 10 siblings, because he's the eldest of 10, even though some of them had their rebellious moments, my grandparents prayed for them and the Lord, you know, held them close by. Bless you that, know? yeah. My parents prayed for us. They had no other option. We were only in public schools in California. The Lord kept all of us close to him. So I do believe in God's sovereign protection. But I also know that if you do have an option, you know, and you are praying, the Lord is like, well, I've, I've given you a lifeline here. 
you can homeschool, you can private school. You're not in a communist country yet. <laughs> uh, so, although some people uh, say California is, but <laughs> it, it is, yeah, right, right. We still so, have that freedom. We still have that freedom, and I believe God expects us to use that freedom wisely. So, for parents who do have that option, please remove your kids from public school. And here is another kind of greater strategy that I present to parents. When you remove your child from the public school system in California, you're talking about $20,000 being extracted out of the government run schools. When you as a teacher remove yourself from the public teachers union, you are defunding them by $1,300 per year. I mentioned the 6.2 million kids in public schools when we started. Our message to get out now um, has always been that, basically from the get-go. Today in California, we're at 5.8 million. There, in four and a half years, there have been over 400,000 kids removed from the public schools in California. Now, I don't know how many organizations like POK exist that have been trumpeting this. Um, so I don't want to take all the credit for it. Um, to, to God be the glory for that. But um, this has been our message. This is how we've equipped other grassroots organizations that we've, we've you know, helped along the way. Um, and, and I believe it is due to a great part of how we are exposing this evil. When you multiply 400,000 times 20,000, we're talking now about hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. Now, our public schools in California got a reprieve because when COVID hit, the governor said, we will still fund you at this formula with this much butts, butts in seats from you know 2019, but that's ending this year. And so the fiscal cliff is looming. So, um, when, when you do something like that, I asked a question of a, of a, of a person that works at the state department of education. And I said, give me a target out of those 6.2 million kids. This is back in the team. How many do we need to remove in order to bankrupt the system? And this person said, look, just a little over a million. And I'm like, okay. That's my goal. That's my goal. We're, we're almost halfway there. In four years, we're almost halfway there. So I believe that we can bring the government-run school system down to its knees. And, and I believe that it's, it's already happening. In fact, one of the, the, um, the editor's notes, comments that I made to our Orange County uh, Register Back in 2019, I, I made this prediction and they actually published this. I said, the government school will die the slow and painful death of a million parental rights cuts. I love it. And I believe that will be true. Right. It's show me the money, right? <laughs> Sometimes that's the only language that we share, unfortunately, um, with those on the of this who are part of this triple threat and um good for you i mean that's a phenomenal record in just four years so very impressive numbers and it like you said it shows that there is such a an acute desire from parents to have something better for their kids even if it means sacrificing and doing something really scary like leaving the school system that they've known all their lives um so that's that's just phenomenal and I love, too, that um, I was reading a little bit about the organization. POK, you're not just saying, like, get out now, but you're actually building options for parents. And you've started, you've helped start several schools now in California, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Correct. So one of the things that we struggled early on was we felt like we were just the people crying wolf. <laughs> right. <laughs> get off the boat. Yeah. Jump in the water. <laughs> and, and it's hard to do just that. We also wanted to provide solutions. And so um, we spent a lot of time talking to uh, parents who were homeschooling. In fact, you know, Mark Schneider homeschooled his kids. Um, and so he had you know, tangible 20 years of experience on how to do that. Um, 
I had switched my children to go to, to private schooling. So I had a lot of experience with, with my kids doing that. But then we started learning about all of these other hybrid models um, that had only been in existence for a, a little bit of time. And uh, we spent the greater part of uh, 2020, once we got shut down, because we couldn't do those conferences anymore, uh, to, to think through a solution. And one of the biggest things that we learned in going around and doing these conferences at churches was churches have all of this, you know, real estate that is not, yeah, it's not used Monday through Friday during the day. And so we said, okay, how about if we start helping pastors think through how do they use their space wisely to partner with parents in their church to become a solution and a haven for their children. Okay. So um, we, we ended up publishing a 20 page booklet uh, on how to do that, how to start an alternative school in your church, very targeted towards pastors. We have now mailed that out to 1000 senior pastors in California. We're getting ready to mail that out to a thousand pastors in California. We're getting re ready to mail it out to 600 pastors in Arizona. And, and what we're trying to figure out here is the responsiveness of these pastors because California doesn't have school choice. And so pastors will always say, well, my parents and my, you know, parish can't afford, you know, to pay, you know, even two or three or $4,000 per school year, you know, cause they have three, four kids that they need to send. Um, and we're testing it in Arizona where there is school choice, where they have $7,000 per child per school year to take and to pay for this. And we want to see how this is all going to play out. Um, but we've helped start already three of those schools. Um, and we've helped dozens other pastors think through, um, how to launch their schools as well. There's also a really good organization called the Herzog foundation, which we got connected to a year ago, and this is their sole mission. And what they do is they give you a much more in-depth training online. They have this eight modules that they take you through online. Um, it's going to take you, you know, a good six to eight hours to get through all of that. But once you get through it, all you have to do is pay a round trip ticket to Missouri where they're headquartered and they will house you and feed you and teach you for three days at no charge to you. And they'll teach you how to open up a school. They'll teach you everything from, you know, the marketing that it takes, the organizational leadership that it takes, uh, all of the, the legal governance and structures to go through. They'll teach you about all of the kind of models, all the kind of, you know, is it going to be a classical education? Is it a classical Christian education? What, what kind of, you know, pedagogy to, to choose? And then at the end of the day, after they do all of that with you, they actually give you a mentor. They pair you up with a school somewhere else in the country that is the closest aligned to your model, who has already implemented it successfully. So that way you have somebody to go to as you're putting it into practice to ask questions. So I highly encourage people to also go to the Herzog Foundation. That's phenomenal. Yeah. And there's lots of, there's so many resources now compared to even five years ago for parents that you're not on your own, you're not stranded, but you can actually do something better for your kids. Uh, it's been great talking to you. And we just want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise and all that you're doing in the Vineyard of the Lord in California's vineyards. And um, we will continue to pray for your ministry um, and for everything that you're doing with Protect Our Kids. So again, I just want to plug, go to protectourkidsnow.org for more information on uh, what George is doing with his colleagues there. And we would also just encourage you to uh, take a look at what's going on in your area and get involved in your schools. Um, like you said, don't throw your kids to the cannibals. But get out there and fight those cannibals yourself, mom and dad. And there's plenty of people supporting you. Um, George, it's been a pleasure. I'm expecting our eighth child right now. And if I just pray that we will be as blessed in our eighth child as your parents were in theirs. So thank you again. Wow. And may God bless you. May God bless you too, Erica. Take care. Take care.